we will be presenting both uh, interdisciplinary teaching programs. So this is a program that uses place to truly teach in an in interdisciplinary manner. And other than the humanities program, I think that this is one of the few uh, programs that really focuses on uh, examining subjects through many disciplinary lenses. And uh, so we'll present the program to you um, and the fact and sort of faculty perspectives of teaching in the program. We hope that we can get people excited and want to teach in the program. John, you should be teaching in this program. I've said that to you before. But <laughs> OK. And, um, and then the great thing is uh, the Finding Your Place first year program is in its fourth year. Actually, it's fifth year if you count the planning year. And so we have the opportunity this spring to uh, survey the entire student body so that we could try to identify the impacts of this first year experience on four cohorts of Finding Your Place students. And so Jordan Troisi will be presenting uh, the results of that research. So we've got a little bit of uh, interdisciplinary teaching program discussion and then some research. Okay. So when we started developing FYP in 2012, part of our vision was simply how to use place-based learning to highlight some of Swanee's most cherished assets, our land and our community. Certainly at the core of this vision was the goal of providing transformative experiences that anchored incoming students early on to our community, engaging both their intellectual and social selves. I think a lot of us know here that the students that we have in class, even some of the best students, have a completely different social life that isn't very well married to their intellectual self. <laughs> That's fine. As the vast body of literature quickly came apparent to me, my colleagues and me, this, this um, place-based course also provided a transformative teaching experience for us. And we want to share this and encourage as many faculty colleagues to become part of this interdisciplinary work that has yielded not just teaching experiences, but collaborative projects. And it's been such a privilege of mine to teach with so many different faculty and learn from them. So today we're here to describe how we use place as a means of engaging first-year students what it has meant for our teaching, and quantitatively what we see after four years of welcoming a significant portion of our first year students to campus through the FYP program. So I'm just going to begin with a brief description of the program and a, a few personal reflections about why PLACE. And I should start off by saying that uh, PLACE is a pretty natural thing for an ecologist such as myself to fo use as fo a focus for my research. Uh, but Unbeknownst to me, before I started this pro before I began developing this program with the help of many, many colleagues, uh, I was unaware of this vast uh, literature of place and place-based learning. And so that's also been very informative, learning about that. So uh, building on previous first year program that was here before finding your place, we wanted to welcome freshmen to campus, to, to college life in a way that highlighted academic culture and connected students early to our land, history, and community. Let's see if I can get some. There we go. So we wanted to provide a grounded introduction to college life that anchored students to our community. We wanted also better integration of students' intellectual selves and their social selves. And we wanted to create an immersive experience that required students to examine this place through a variety of disciplinary lenses, and by doing so, develop their appreciation for complexity and cultivate their skills in synthesis. By confronting complexity and deeply exploring what we, what's, what we hoped students would become anchored to this place and more skilled at becoming rooted to any place they go to. So we had some, also just, we wanted to build on, uh, build early on skills for academic success, particularly uh, close reading, uh, engaged civil discussion, reflective writing, and, and synthetic, synth synthetic thinking and analysis. And um, just as John mentioned, and all of you have mentioned, this interdisciplinary way of viewing the world is going to be imp increasingly important and we thought that it would be best if students came to college expecting to learn that way instead of 
uh, waiting until their senior year to bring it all, to synthesize it all in a capstone project. So we wanted them to know this is a way of knowing from the moment they stepped on campus. And then the other benefit that has really um, been demonstrable is enhancing first year advising. And um, we are still waiting for data on retention, but that was an original goal of the Vice Chancellor, was to try to affect our first and second year retention rate by providing a more um, connective first, uh, first year experience. So what is finding your place? I'm just gonna provide a few logistical details. It integrates um, many iterations of an academic course, a rigorous academic course, with faculty advising and peer mentoring. And so, as many of you know, we come, we, the students come approximately 10 days prior to orientation, and the idea was to bring them on campus and to spend very concentrated time with faculty and be introduced to, you know, uh, eight to a dozen different faculty through plenary lectures. Uh, this really concentrated time with faculty was meant to develop close relationships with faculty advisors and students, as well as peer mentors. And those peer mentors come from our student body. They are trained by student life, and they, they live in the residence halls and attend the classes and participate in the field activities. So we wanted, ideally, to have these peer mentors model the kind of learning and the kind of engagement that we expect from incoming students. So the August portion consists of a common course that is interdisciplinary and it focuses on this place. And um, by using this place as a vehicle, we can examine, we can model interdisciplinary exploration as well. So colleagues talk about this place much in the way that John and John just did from many disciplinary lenses. And we use this period of uninterrupted time to take students on field excursions that allow them to really uh, immerse themselves in these ideas and to start seeing the connections among di disciplines uh, for, for, for this place. Uh, so there's plenary lectures uh, that I'll talk about in a minute. We've got common readings and then there are common field experiences and then faculty also take students on field excursions that are particular to their uh, discipline. Uh, th and then the course continues for half the semester <coughs> as a regular course, it's usually a once a week seminar um, that allows, again, for field time if, if um, wanted. And we call this perspective development because it's at this point that faculty can share with students um, the, the, their, their disciplinary lens in more depth. And then the students all conduct capstone projects at the end, which allows them the opportunity to go deeper into one area. And, um, and some of those capstone projects will be presented at Scholarship Swanee this year, so please look for them. I'm really excited by them. I'm, I'm actually blown away by the quality of some of these, these presentations. I mean, these are freshmen, and they're, they're, they're engaging in this already. And then we are freshman advisors, and that advising task is made not only easier, it's absolutely delightful from my perspective. Okay. So this is uh, a picture of one of our, our plenary lectures. We use Convocation Hall because of the gravitas of the place. And we have you know, around 200 students uh, from all, of all different interests come and listen to panel discussions that are very scholarly in nature, but it's when our colleagues present uh, topics about Swati and the surrounding region from their disciplinary lens. And we've had uh, just a, a, a lovely array of topics. I learn something from every single lecture that's given. But what I think most of our colleagues will agree, what's most fascinating about it, is these students who are barely more than graduated high school seniors stand up in a room of 200 of their peers and they ask the most thought-provoking, reflective questions. I think that astonished all of us at first. And now it's just part of the culture. You know, would you all like to just bust in and make and make points, or do you want to wait? I'd just like to ask about the self-selection process uh -huh. of those students who want to participate uh -huh. and what methodologies are used to encourage, I don't want to say the better students, mm -hmm. but the students who have the time and inclination to want to come 10 days early, not for football practice. Right. Or can they come for football practice? No, and that's, that's you know, there are many structural issues that, I think will be addressed in coming years. 
Uh, and that's one of them because personally, no, I, I would like this to be available for a larger body of students, and it's not. Right. So we've kind of come to the detente of where we think that pre, which is an excellent program, and, and teams, fall sports, right? Those are all ways in which students can create family and community when they first arrive on campus, which is another really important uh, part of this program. But we are really, um, we really love the scholarly nature of it, the fact that it's a rigorous academic course. And to be honest, I think that's what makes it a signature program right. for Swanee. Yeah. So how, did, how are they chosen? How are they? They're not chosen. They just apply. It's first comes, first served. Okay. And so then I, how do you encourage 200 people to apply? Or has well, that not been an issue yet? It hasn't. Um, in fact, there's always more people than spaces. Right. And, um, what, what, what's more difficult is actually recruiting enough faculty to meet the demand. Right. That's the thing, right? So, uh, now, do they pay more? No. This this year they're paying a small fee for it's it's, it's to give it, it's so that so that the football players when they push the button to register for FYP have to think that oh no I can't because and when they pay that thirty dollar fee but it's actually for their books. Other than that, it's all covered within their tuition. So it's 30 bucks. But, but room and board, though, is... It, it is covered. So so, it, so it's no different than if they had started in the regular beginning. No different. Right. No different. This is one of their four courses. Right. Yes, That's exactly. This is one of their four courses. And it now, these courses now um, mostly have gen ed attributes, So they, um, which is a good thing. That didn't start out that way. So. Um, they don't pay for it. They come early. It is part of their academic course load. The course ends in mid-October because we've invested so much in the front end. And we, that is um, beneficial because it allows a lot of these uh, first year students to focus mightily on their other three courses when things start to get really difficult. And uh, uh, so. Is that, how, is that how it's marketed as well a little bit? Or yes, no, or definitely. Okay, so and that was intentional. It wasn't, I mean, it's practical, but it's also intentional. Yeah. What? Yeah, I, I can see why that would be attractive. It's attractive to faculty. It's also it is, yes, <laughs> yes, it is. It's very, it's very attractive. Uh, so I think one of the goals of this immersive, this in, uh, what we call interdisciplinary immersion, that's the first phase of FYP during August, is to really experience complexity. And um, you'll see a lot of pictures of, of out of, of outdoor landscapes, but the places that students visit are not at all limited to that. They go to a variety of, of, of different places that contribute to their understanding of our place and our community. Um, so Jeff Thompson took them to the Hunter Museum of Art in, uh, uh, in uh, Chattanooga, and uh, in, I'm sure my other colleagues can tell you the myriad of places they've gone. Sid Brown has taken them to Buddhist temples. You took them to uh, Iona, did you not, Virginia? No, oh, <laughs> no, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of the, um, well, the what? Next year. Next year. We've, but Jordan and I had a joint trip to uh, the, um, what am I? The Highlander. the Highlander Folk School. It was really great. We had had them watch this, this film called You Got to Move, which is about the history of the Highlander Folk School. And then we gave, you know, we took them there. And I think a lot of my colleagues do take them to the Highlander Folk School. And have had them stand where, Jordan? Uh, when you look, if you were to visit the uh, historical museum that's in Grundy County, uh, they have those photographs uh, of including the Highlander Folk School. And I noticed specifically in those photographs, the exact spot where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood. So I had all of the students before they realized that's what was happening, stand in the very spot and look out over the road. And then afterwards, between both of our classes, we had a discussion just about the film, civil about rights, the ideas, yeah. about civil rights, education. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was really, really splendid. Yeah. And, and, so, and so this time before the beginning of the semester, when it's concentrated and uninterrupted, allows for these these experiences that help us make connections better in a way that we all wish we could during our regular semester. Uh, so the, what I love, the, the caves provide one of the best examples for me of how we look at a single place from many, many perspectives. So uh, Sarah Sherwood, of course, will look at the prehistory of caves in one of our, um, one of our uh, plenary lectures, our grand finale was a, a panel on, on caves. Uh, but we also look at the literature 
uh, written about caves, the mythology, Chris McDonald looked at the mythology about caves. Of course, we look at the geology of caves, the ecology of cave creatures. Uh, so there, we, every, every place can be examined from many disciplinary perspectives. Let me, and let I, me yeah. just add to that briefly. From what is perhaps an entirely different perspective, um, I've taken my FYP class in the Buggy Top Cave. In our hike in and out, there's a dedication to experiences of awe and gratitude. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yes, the natural world, but also very much so the inner emotional and mental world. I'm glad you brought that up. That's so true. And these experiences also, in some ways, really challenge them. Now, to teach an FYP, you don't necessarily have to crawl through Buggy Top Cave. But if you, um, for some of these students, they're also challenging themselves from a personal perspective. And the feeling that they get when they enter college and they, they are terrified by going through this, this cave and they make it through with this group of people creates these deep connections and I think a real sense of self-confidence that we want to see in students as they enter into sort of the unknown waters of college life. Uh, and so once again, we can connect geology to ecology. You know, if you think about Shake Rag Hollow, there's a nice coal vein there that ties all of that geology to the economy of the Cumberland Plateau and to the Mountain Goat Railroad. Uh, and so we, and we visit the Grundy County um, Historical Society and, and, and uh, I think we've had um, a miner who used to mine in Palmer talk to our students as well. So they really get an idea of the history and sort of the, the diversity of socioeconomics in the, in, the, in the plateau as well and the diversity of cultures. And, uh, you know, we embrace a lot of the complex, uncomfortable facts about the institution. And one of those would be uh, arm fields, uh, uh, money, which supported the university in a great deal. And please, John, if I'm butchering this history, forgive me. An alarm will sound. Okay. <laughs> and, um, but, but, but Armfield was a benefactor of the university, and yet he was a slave trader. He made all of his money t trading slaves, and we talk about those sort of things. So they come to campus, and we just talk about it head on. We talk about Ely Green and all of the complexity that, uh, that, that, that his book and his life in Swanee forces us to examine. Just to add briefly Please. to that, uh, as a part of FYP, Students also have discussions of the common book, which this year was Ta-Nehisi Coates. Right. Oh, that was Between the world and me. Uh, this information has yet to come out, although it will very soon. Uh, we will again be reading uh, Coates for the fall. Um, oh, I'm we, glad we to think hear there that. There's still very many things that we wish to talk about both within our classes and in, in FYP. Um, but that also, I found, uh, created a very uh, interesting way of looking at all sorts of issues related to race and economics, both from Ely Green, locally and historically, and then from Coates, um, you know, more globally across the nation, and also in a more uh, modern sense as well. And I would add that having been here long enough to have seen and tried to prompt and prod the discussion of various freshman books over and over, and I have never seen a group of freshmen take apart something as controversial as, as that book, uh, partly because they're familiar with each other, partly because We've read Ely, and they have some uh, some background to put this in, uh, and, and so the, the freshman book or the shared book it, it becomes a really powerful experience, even when it's something that controversial. Because they, by the time we get around to it, they know each other so well. It's fair, and it's, they feel yeah, comfortable. They feel com it's a safe space. <laughs> I was I was really impressed with the conversations that, and I were engendered by that, and the ability for me to actually enter into a conversation like that. That's not my discipline nor my expertise, right? But it made it comfortable. And it was much easier done because there was this historical precedence of Ely. Um, and they could read that. So uh, that was a good, I'm glad you brought that up. And then um, because they're exposed to so many different faculty and their disciplinary lenses, they learn, they learn they're exposed to a lot of disciplinary tools and ways of knowing and ways of viewing the world. And uh, that's been very important from a, from a personal perspective. I know these students so well that I start to know what their interests and passions are. And I can say, 
you know, you might want to try to do research with Sarah Sherwood because this is really interesting to you. Or you should go to uh, Kristen Sakala because you're really interested in fresh, freshwater organisms or you belong with Jeff Thompson. So I, 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 anecdotally, I can say that a lot of students have been um, directed towards opportunities earlier than they would have otherwise been um, engaged in because of the fact that we know them so well and can help them find these opportunities. And then, you know, one of the, I think this was one of the driving forces for me to initially become involved in finding your place was the idea of creating uh, civic citizens and people who are more engaged and concerned about the world. Uh, I know Jim Peterman wanted very desperately to create a culture of, of uh, civic engagement in FYP. And um, I think that um, we'll be sharing some results from uh, our research that demonstrates just that. Um, this was a picture from, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, local organization Mountaintop that has an over 40 year history of working with pretty impoverished families. They go and do home repairs, but our students were able to plug right into Mountaintop and be exposed to uh, experiences and context that you know they would otherwise never have a chance to and I think it had a very deep impression on many of them so what we aspire to is have is to uh, really foster inquiry in students from many disciplinary perspectives and have them recognize that place is a many layered concept and we want students also to recognize the depth and value and, co and culture of all natural landscapes. And for me, it's to help them find their place wherever they can fit in and contribute. So again, um, advising these students and recognizing what talents and gifts they bring has allowed us to, to point them in a direction where they can become involved and, and start uh, giving much earlier. And I think that it creates an ethos of, con of contribution. I think one of the loftier goals from the very beginning, that certainly one of the vice chancellors, was that we could transform the culture of this place with better integrating so students' social and, and intellectual selves. In some ways I see glimpses of that. I think it's a mighty, mighty uh, high expectation. But when you, when you have in relationships with individual students, I think I can definitely see that coming. And then um, we want more colleagues, we want all colleagues on campus to be part of this transformative uh, teaching experience. That was something that was really surprising to me was how, how good it was for faculty. And it had to be because it's pretty demanding. And yet uh, John and Virginia and, and Daniel are, are teaching again in it. So uh, I think that that speaks to the experience itself. I'm sorry, I went back the wrong way. How could I go over? Oh, okay. Finally, um, this is something that I have known innately, and it's the reason for which I, I do a lot of work in Haiti and, and other places. But then when I started to read the literature on it, I realized, oh, this is a thing. This is one of the goals of place-based literature. But that is, if you, know, if you know a place really intimately, you're going to care and love, and love that place. And then you'll also do a better job of becoming an, an engaged citizen in, in all the places that you go to. And so that's one of the goals for me is to, to really foster in students the desire to, to become a steward of whatever place they're in and to, to embrace that complexity with enthusiasm. Why do I keep going backwards? Okay, I want to um, thank all my collaborators. It really has been um, a team effort we work with units across campus, and this was built by faculty. And you can see from that list of, of colleagues that the disciplines <coughs> represented in the program are far more numerous than we initially envisioned. And I really believe that there's a place for all faculty in finding your place. And, and I hope that um, all of you will consider teaching in the program. Oh, and there's one more thing I want to do, if I have time. Do I have a moment or not? I guess it's me. Do I? <laughs> okay. Uh, there was a quote. Um, uh, it was actually, I'm going to quote uh, a portion of uh, Lori Lane Zucker's introduction to David Sobel's book, Place-Based Education, uh, Connecting Classrooms and Communities. 
because it speaks so clear to the question, why place, and especially from my perspective. But it says, the, pl the path to a sustainable existence must start with a fundamental reimagining of the eth ethical, economic, political, and spiritual foundations upon which society is based. And this process needs to occur within the context of a deep local knowledge of place. The solutions to many of our ecological problems lie in an approach that celebrates, empowers, and nurtures the cultural, artistic, historical, and spiritual resources of each local community and region, and champions their ability to bring those resources to bear on the healing of nature and community. Schools and other educational institutions can and should play a central role in this process, but for the most part, they do not. Indeed, they have often contributed to the problem by educating young people to be, in David Orr's words, mobile, rootless, and autistic toward their places. A significant transformation of education might begin with the effort to learn how events and processes close to home relate to regional, national, and global forces and events, leading to a new understanding of ecological stewardship and community. So I'd like to just thank you all for, the, for listening to me. And now I am going to, I think I'm holding it upside down. I'm going to welcome my colleagues uh, Virginia Craighill, who is a teaching professor of English and has taught in the program as long as I have. Uh, John Willis, t uh, professor of history, also uh, one of the original uh, developers of FYP. Daniel Carter, who joined the uh, program last year and will be teaching in it again, but is a native son to Marion County and so probably knows this place better than any of us. And Jordan Troisi, who uh, Let's see, I've got this. Who uh, studies uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning and who joined the program a year ago and then conducted this research to evaluate the impact of the experience on our first year students. So thanks. So would you, how do you want to do this? Would you just like to talk about uh, your experiences? for four years and so that you know it's not just a two-year commitment to advising a lot of times you you stay with them um, so I just wanted to talk about how important that relationship is that you can have with the students that you bond with in those first ten days um, you, you know you really are kind of taking them under your wing and you can learn a lot from them too and then I just wanted to talk briefly about um, we haven't English was not mentioned in many of the disciplines that were on the PowerPoint, but so how does English, how did I do this? What, why did I do it? And um, I wanted to just give you my approach to how I've taught my section of FYP for three years. Um, I call it uh, uh, Your Place or Mine, the Tension of Narrative in Place. And to, I have borrowed a lot of metaphors from my colleagues, and that's part of the beauty of interdisciplinary teaching, is I'm learning from my colleagues all the time, seeing the way that they see the world and using it uh, metaphorically to talk about what I do. So to start with a geological um, sort of metaphor, I love stories, and I want my students to understand um, how stories create place, how you know a place through narrative. 
And that narrative has to stop at the, you know, start at the limestone layer of, um, you know, the, the history, the stories way back in history from the founders of the university and sort of move up through the geological layers of narrative into, until you get to um, the contemporary stories. And so we read uh, Ely, we read Sarah Barnwell Elliott, we read um, William Alexander Percy, um, a variety of different stories about this place. And so as they're sort of moving up through the layers, then finally I say go out and interview, learn the story of someone who lives in this place, who is not a fellow student and who is not a faculty member, someone that you might not normally cross path, paths with, with. And so they interview, you know, sometimes community members, sometimes um, staff. Two, uh, this year, two of my FYP students interviewed Martha Long, who's a custodian in their building. They just lived in the same dorm. And so they gave me her, the interview they had with her, and I realized, oh, this is the woman who is also the custodian um, for Gaylor Hall, who leaves me a nice Christmas card every year, but who I've never had the chance to meet because she works at night. So all of a sudden, I knew her story, you know, and I was connected to her the same way that they became connected to her through um, learning her story. So that was sort of how they moved through history up to the contemporary story of place. But I'm also asking them to learn about the tension of narrative, that you there's not just one story about place and that people are going to tell the same story different ways and that sometimes the voices of a place have been silenced and that you have to try to learn those stories too, however you can. So one of the things we do, just a, a quick case study, um, we'll read Sarah Barnwell Elliott's story about Lost Cove and written in the voice of a woman um, who lived in Lost Cove in the voice of what was then called a Cobite, um, someone who, who grew up down there and then came up to the university to market um, things at the university. And the fact that Sarah Barnwell Elliott, who um, is what's a, you know, kind of daughter of a founding father of the university, very privileged white woman, a woman whose voice would have also been silenced had she not been a published author, is writing about someone who, whose voice would be silenced. Um, is that right? And we kind of talk about that ethical um, problem. We read Ely, and then we read Coates, which was a very nice kind of dynamic as well. Um, and, and we discuss, you know, how these things are uh, interesting, these different voices. And we went to Lost Cove, you know, the field trip, and Lizzie Motlow told us that Sarah Barnwell Elliott had never actually gone to Lost Cove. So, <laughs> so you know, it's another layer of that. So that's, you know, the way that I teach my section, but I, I can't emphasize enough the, the great relationships I have with these students um, for four years and the great relationship I have with my colleagues that I've taught with. So I'll pass it on. Well, Virginia, can I ask really quickly? Sure. Maybe yeah. never, you would know this. When the students are signing up, would they say, oh, I have an interest in English and ecology? I mean, the, how did you end up with so many Englishy students that stayed with you the whole way? Well, do you know? perhaps atrophy. Um, <laughs> they, just, they, they just kind of, well, I don't, I don't know what else to do. Um, no, that's not true. I think at the first they did, lies. yes, okay. ask and for And they do, they can, they, 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 they raise their preferences. Mm -hmm. Do you find they stay together quite well as a social cohort? Um, I, I guess I'm sort of interested because students sometimes to me say, everything's kind of great the first semester and then we all <laughs> rush and everything and men and women don't really hang out together except in a different way, which is not always positive. And I'm just <laughs> right. wondering, I, 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 I don't know, as a student maybe you can talk to this. But talk about this, but um, do they keep these sort of cohorts going? Well, I, I can give you an anecdotal answer. You know, the second semester after FYP, the first year that I taught it, I had a 101 class that was filled, except for one person, with all FYP students. Not all mine, some of them were and some of them weren't. But then um, recently at an event uh, that was a kind of student event, um, you know, where it's like a Valentine's Day party where they brought dates. And I was looking around and thought, oh my gosh, all these people were first year FYP students. And they all were together. And it was really, you know, I, I think they're cohorts that kind of go their separate ways in separate disciplines, but 
they all, I, I felt like that first group really bonded. Um, that's my experience, but I can't, you know, that's an anecdote. I don't know if I'll, I'll speak true. a little bit more because I kind of want to later. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right. Go ahead. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, I would affirm what Deb and Virginia have said. Uh, and let me take this in a slightly different direction under the heading of faculty are curious people. Curious, and also with curiosity, <laughs> I should say. Um, because one of the things that stood out to me is we knew that any sort of program like this, if it got its legs and hung around for a while, any sort of program that, that brought together all of these different things, plenary lectures, seminars, uh, work in the field, community engagement, that that would probably have a strong impact on students. What I don't think we realized as well was the strong impact that working in this sort of program would have on faculty members. And because we're curious people, while we're still in school learning, uh, it's great to be able to participate in this and to be able to learn from our colleagues who become our friends and to have that structure for sharing information. As, uh, as I talked in the earlier session, I I'm doing some research on this area uh, for our history. But what I've been really astounded by is how much I've learned from my colleagues in all sorts of disciplines not necessarily about what they bring and can tell me, but by what they ask me. And sometimes by what they connect their question to, like, I read this piece in the whatever, or there's this book, have you ever seen it? Um, so I think one of the things that's been, for me at least, um, demonstrable is the way that teaching in FYP creates a sort of community, not just for students, but for faculty too. And it supports uh, a set of overarching but changing questions we bring to the material that's in front of us. And, and, and that's been a good thing. We have a, a workshop that's going to be in May. Yeah, May 16th through 18th. And there's more spaces. Available. Yeah, and, and I would encourage people. Several, several folks have participated in that May workshop just to say, you know, I'm kind of curious about this. It probably won't work for me, but I want to see what they're doing. And uh, many of those people are teaching in the program now. Um, and, and Deb will give them back their children after the first year they teach. So. <laughs> um, but, but it's a really helpful thing. And, and we not only uh, talk about uh, teaching goals and text, but we do a, a lot of wandering around and trying to figure out how uh, we could bring some of the, uh, the field into the classroom or students out into the field. So I would just emphasize that one of the things that I, I don't think anybody really predicted would happen, but I think has been a very strong feature for those of us who participate, is that, that we feel an inclusion in this program, and we have uh, been able to benefit intellectually, uh, not just by teaching, but also by learning. So that's my view. Well, the only thing I would add that we haven't talked about, which I find a very interesting dynamic, section is assigned two mentors that were previous FYP. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I don't know that I had really two very strong mentors. And they really engaged in the learning process. And now the relationships, because I advise them now, um, I know for a fact one of my mentors took one of the Chinese students in, so under her wing is continuing to take care of her. Uh, really, really adds to the learning experience, um, and makes it also, you know, they're an extension of your of teaching as well. So, I just wanted to add that as a, I think that's something that uh, uh, you wouldn't find in other classes. If you find it in I, I just want to highlight, reiterate, perhaps extend a little bit on some of the points already gone. Uh, Virginia, I do.
we look to do things that have interdisciplinarity to them, I haven't found anything more satisfying than doing FYP both in the course as well as in the workshop and training and discussion and thinking about these ideas. Uh, I did the FYP workshop after my first year here um, with no direct plans of teaching in it uh, the next year. I didn't teach in the next year, or I did the year after. Um, and it was at that workshop when we were in the field and we were talking to people, I think we were at, at King's Farm when I first noticed this, uh, people discussing different ideas, different points of view, and what their lens allowed them to understand about the place. And I was, you know, I was looking back and forth between folks like John, and uh, Sarah Sherwood, and other individuals, and just thinking, this is what college education is all about. This is, I, mean, I mean, I wish we could just have a circle of students around us watching the expertise flow out of these individuals and, and the questions and the discussion and the civil discourse that we have in education. Um, and I would highlight as well that as a newer faculty member at that point in time, um, I could think of very few things that would be a better orientation to this university, the faculty, place as an environment uh, that people may be a part of. Um, I learned so much that was both beneficial for things that I might use in class or things that I might do on a Sunday morning or late night. Um, yeah, it was really cool. Um, do you to, I mean, I've got some, some information I'm going to present, but do other folks have questions before we get to those kinds of things? Thank you. Thank you for four of you. I exhaust myself. Yeah, it's yeah. tiring. Right. I exhaust myself in those 10 days. Right. And I know I exhaust the students too. But I, there's so much I want to introduce yeah. them to. Yeah. And a lot of it we can only reach on foot. So. I, I agree, the same, but, but they're, they're very predictable. I mean, it, it's not as though I was surprised by it. I knew those that interdisciplinary immersion was going to be an intense time period. So I said, that's what I do for those 10 days. I just hang out for our contact list. I, I do want to mention that the class sizes now that it's getting larger. It's as we travel, we go to the Squatchy Valley. It's nice if I had them all in one van. So much can be learned. Yeah. You learn while you're in the van. Mm -hmm. And when you end up with two vans, <laughs> it, you know, a lot of the time gets eaten up that in which you're kind of you're talking to this one group of students, but you can only you know, do the events at once. So. Businessman and party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're jamming out the other <laughs> Do you find any of the objectives at times conflict with each other? I mean, in some ways, sort of thinking about the university's place in the community, but also doing community activism. Sometimes those can be, to, you, I mean, obviously you try and manage this, but I'm just wondering if some of the objectives, you know, so some of it's probably to make the, you know, retention, right? Sort of like to make them sort of, in a way, perhaps love this university, but, but in a complicated way, right? Which yeah. is love, but, yeah. um, but, but then, <laughs> but then, but then um, also, you're also trying to do civic engagement. I just wonder if any of these things do you find you have to be cognizant of how these might actually? I think it's good for them to confront complication. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'll just, yeah. Yeah. And that's good thinking. Mm -hmm. And I would say for me, I, I think about this as, um, you know, we, we bring different things to the table. For me, my work is not one so deeply rooted in things like community engagement, uh, whereas I'm more interested in like abstract con uh, conceptual ideas about place, whereas other individuals for some students, it's kind of the luck of the draw in terms of what they will focus on. Um, but I think it's all part of the bigger picture. All right. All right. So, so I've, got some, I've got some information. Well, again, thank you all for for joining us here. Uh, as as Deb mentioned, uh, we've conducted a survey on this. Um, I want to really, I want to the way I want to approach this, I want to move through it quickly, and then have time for questions and discussion. Um, so. As Deb mentioned, <coughs> we've done this survey recently, and how I might conceptualize FYP, at least for me, and how I come to think about it. An immersive experience for students with their professor and advisor, their residence hall staff, and their classmates. 10 days before the sort of everyday business of college begins. 
And in fact, a, a sort of anecdotal complaint that some of the students say is like, oh, I'm, re I'm looking forward to getting into a regular schedule and things like that. Of course, about four weeks after FYP ends, they say, I wish we could go back to FYP. <laughs> then they also say that as well. Um, but that highlighted, I think, very well some very important objectives. So I'll just, I'll just very briefly go through these. A grounded introduction to the college life, the college experience, uh, a building of uh, academic skills, this interdisciplinary focused, uh, centered around place, a shared intellectual experience for those who are going to be a part of it, um, an effort to foster an appreciation for community, um, and uh, increased opportunities for um, first year advising. So Deb has mentioned those and I'm happy to talk more about them, but broadly these are the kinds of things that we're looking for uh, within FYP. Um, and this January and February um, we uh, conducted a survey uh, for which all students at the university were invited to be a part. Uh, we asked questions about a lot of different uh, experiences that they had or had not had at Sewanee. Um, it was done online. Um, took most individuals about 10 or 15 minutes to complete. Um, and we're just going to present some of the information that we found from within there. So uh, it was a survey to all students at the college, regardless of whether they have been in FYP or not. Um, as as uh, Deb could attest um, from our budget, with some hefty incentives uh, to get them involved. Um, but that said, ended up with quite a large sample. So 373 of our students completed it. Among them, uh, 121, about a third of them have been in FYP, um, and about uh, 250 had not been in FYP. So we're looking at um, a fairly large group, fairly well distributed across class years, um, as is often the case, more females completing than males, although oh, certainly... As is always the case. As, as, is, I said, uh, as is often the case. But as is often the case in psychological research, uh, especially among college students, uh, when, you, when you open it up, um, and, and ask for volunteers. And it's typical that you'll see more women than men completing the materials. <laughs> well, these were, th th these were cash incentives. Uh, they were Amazon gift cards, uh, drawing for Amazon gift cards. And some of them were, some of them were big. I think it was the big ticket one. We, we did a, a schedule for which um, there was one very large one, uh, a couple that were um, reasonably large, but not terribly large, and then a fair amount that were, I think, $10 or something like that. Have you thought about like, gender-specific incentives? Um, I mean, it is something of consideration, although I think for things like uh, gift cards, uh, it, it should be fairly, uh, fairly yeah. reasonably split. Uh, split. Um, there are other circumstances in which you could just do cash, which is good for everyone, although that said, our university doesn't allow for those systems um, when conducting research, so we've I'm dodged sorry, it. I'm sorry, I'm sure, sure. this is news to me. Sure. Can, yeah. can you tell me um, one or two brief rationalizations mm -hmm. psychologists use to sure. explain sure. the double the uh, female response? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, Don't say caring, nurturing. Should we ask a <laughs> Should we ask a female? Um, I would say that this this sort of numerical breakdown is typical. Yes. The reasons why are a little bit harder to pin down precisely. I mean, we know that at the university we're looking at about 50-50 when it comes to yes. men and women. So by the numbers, you expect that it would be uh, fairly even. Um, that said. And th this is anecdotal. I do not have uh, data to back this up. Um, something that I have observed here, which is typical of um, a fair amount of other colleges and universities as well, um, is that women seem to often be more invested in their specific college experience in such a way that uh, perhaps the way I would frame it is that um, if men don't get a lot out of college, they'll be OK if women don't get a lot out of college, they might not be okay. They might not get that job. Um, it's a rationalization and it's, it's post hoc and it is not based on data. Um, but that's, these sorts of numbers are typical. But, but how does that factor into the decision to fill out the survey? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if, it factors into uh, all sorts of um, <laughs> things that one might be invested in when it comes to uh, the college experience, this college experience, I mean, we framed very clearly that this was about their Sewanee experience. Um, 
For example, if you look at uh, institutions that do lots of research, um, let's say within psychology departments or other departments, if you look at um, when students who have a requirement to be a part of research, I won't go into all the great details about why and how that all works, um, you find that at the very beginning of the semester you have almost exclusively female participants, and then as the semester wears on, you have many, many, many more male participants who, by the end, um, need the studies so that they don't fail their courses. Um, so it, it's typical. Are more women in I don't know the exact numbers. It's pretty evenly distributed. Yeah. It is, surprisingly. But what about, what about the um, mentors? Isn't it more? No, well, actually, so last year we only had two mentors out of, I don't know, 22 that were female, but, or, uh, or the either male, excuse me. But um, this year we got it even split. We have oh. 80. 80 students apply to be FYP mentors. Wow. Unbelievable. That's terrific. Right? But we do see this also like in um, spring break outreach trips, mm -hmm. just outreach trips, mm -hmm. it's all women. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Additionally, I mean, I've been participating and, and uh, going to a number of events related to social justice concerns and community engagement and things like that. And, and as some of my colleagues, uh, Jeff Thompson and I were chatting about this once, um, we'll be at an event, we'll say, where are all the white men? <laughs> like we've got, we've got women, and we've also got our men of color, but so few white men, given the population of the university. So. I know where they are. They're, yeah. they're at the business seminar. They're at the business seminar, the other one uh, that's going on. Uh, so anyway. I'm sorry to do No, that. no, it's quite all right. Yeah, so that's what we're working with. When, when sure. was this uh, survey done? This was conducted in January and February of this year, so just, so just a couple I, months ago. I wonder ago. to what extent Rush might affect that. Because right. Because an interesting finding is that, I mean, um, the respondents are older rather than younger. Mm -hmm. The older cohorts are going to be smaller. Mm -hmm. The freshmen and sophomore are more likely to be involved with Rush. Correct, correct. So I wonder if that also affects the Yeah, it's, the it's possible. We, we began at about two or three weeks into the semester of this, of this spring. Um, I, I don't keep up on when Rush is precisely. Um, and sure two weeks that's right. <laughs> um, this is possibly a factor. Mm -hmm. um, that said, all right, let me, let me get to, um, Sorry. Sorry. that's okay. <laughs> Some of the information uh, that we asked about, um, so we, we framed this as a, uh, a survey on Sewanee experiences. We asked a handful of questions. Um, were they participants in FYP? We asked questions about their relationships with their advisor, or residence hall staff. Uh, experience during their first semester and experiences throughout college. Um, and of course, individuals who are in their first year um, will answer some questions and won't answer some of the other ones that they may not have been a part of. Um, the survey was designed in such a way so that uh, if individuals have been a part of something, you know, they say, yes, I've done this, and we'd ask them a couple of follow-up questions. But if they said no, they'd, they'd skip right to the next one, saving them both time and frustration um, and also uh, ensuring a greater sense of uh, validity to our data because we knew individuals who had said no to something weren't then muddying up the waters uh, thereafter. Um, so uh, I'm gonna sort of just put a lot at you right now and I'm happy to talk about it um, much more so. Uh, but basically, um, well, let me step back. Overall, when we look at both FYP students and non-FYP students, when we look at the survey information, they tend to report fairly to extremely favorable attitudes about things related to Suwannee, their experience in their courses, their experiences with their advisor. Um, for those of us who know data and statistics, uh, I'd point out that this was all skewed, um, what we call negative skew, uh, meaning that almost everything is at the very high end, right. and there are very few responses at the very low end. That's, that's the case for um, almost all of these questions. And any differences that we do see are just slightly um, slightly deviating from that overly, immensely positive view that individuals do seem to have of most of the, um, most of the things we examined. Um, these comparisons present um, the results for FYP students as compared to non-FYP students. And those categories are meaningful. We're, this is not a comparison between FYP students and any other group. It's only were they in FYP or were they not in FYP. Um, I've got uh, information on the statistics uh, in the middle, and I'll point out some differences that do emerge. Uh, we asked a, a pair of questions. 
um, about their initial comfort and connection with their first advisor. For FYP students, this would also, for almost all of them, although not exclusively, be their FYP professor. <coughs> and we see, I mean, I won't go into great detail on the statistics, but the appropriate test in this circumstance is a t-test. I measure a measure of effect size and statistical significance there. And we see that individuals who are in FYP uh, report a greater sense of comfort and connection uh, initially with their first advisor. Now, do bear in mind, this question is the same for all individuals regardless of class year. So if they're in their first year, they are reflecting on their advisor who's likely still a, their advisor from you know, their experiences the semester before up until now. If these are seniors answering this question, we're asking them, your first advisor, think of who that was. What was your experience like with that individual? Um, so we see FYP students respond more favorably uh, about their initial connection with their advisor. They also report, they were asked and they report, currently, how comfortable are you with that individual who was your first advisor? And similarly, those who are in FYP uh, report more favorable comfortability and connection with their advisor. Same pattern of findings with regard to uh, how they feel about their residence hall staff, the individuals who are on staff in their residence halls um, during their first year. Um, so not current staff during their first year. Um, as is the case in, in FYP, these individuals um, are coming in early, going through lots of orientation type processes, getting to know individuals in their residence halls. They're also still more comfortable and connected with those individuals who are in their uh, residence hall staff early on, suggesting this is a fairly formative experience. Um, we asked them directly, this, so these items are pairs of items, but this is the direct item itself, it's just the one. Um, during my first semester, I engaged in a significant learning experience at Sewanee, and we find that individuals who were in FYP uh, agree with this to a greater degree than individuals who were not. Um, not to discredit all of our other courses that are being taught to first year students, but it seems that being involved in FYP uh, is something that makes them say, I'm engaging in a significant learning experience here. We also ask them, um, did you have experiences that you thought would be valuable for other first year students to have? Presumably excursions, going to local sites, finding out new information, uh, finding out other information or places on campus that are interesting or curious or valuable. Um, individuals in FYP uh, report that they thought they were engaging in some of these more valuable experiences. Um, and this effect is marginal, so in, in truth, whether we should rely on it or not, I'm, I'm up in the air, but that said it is in the predicted direction and is a fairly strong effect. Um, individuals also report they were introduced to places around Sewanee that helped them function in their day-to-day -day life here. So. Uh, did I know where to go for certain things? A handful more. Students in FYP as well begin participation in community engagement work sooner in their college experience than individuals who are not in FYP. So we asked them, uh, um, at what point did you first engage in um, community engagement work? We asked them based on semester or summertime and things like that. Uh, FYP students engage in it sooner, and they also engage in it more frequently than individuals who are not in FYP. I'll point out, I don't, I don't give this a lot of weight for a number of reasons, and I could, I could go into great length. Uh, they also come in with a somewhat, although not significantly higher, grade point average. The reason why I don't give this a lot of weight is that these measurements of grade point average are not standardized through the admissions process. Um, I got that information from the admissions office. Basically, whatever the schools report is the GPA that they take, despite the fact that some students within this data set have GPAs higher than 5.0 coming in here. <laughs> take that for what it is. Anyway. I'll also point out, we asked a set of questions as well about a number of other um, things that we thought might be important, valuable, impl uh, implemented here. Um, I'll point out that there were no effects for these questions, and I'd be happy to go into more detail. No effects 
meaning that they were equivalent in both groups. So FYP students are answering them at equivalent uh, degrees of agreement as individuals who are not in FYP. Um, we asked a question about how much do you feel connected to Suwannee overall, equivalent across the groups. Um, we asked about studying abroad and outreach trips. They don't seem to study abroad any earlier or engage in out outreach trips any earlier. Um, but that it's limited what they could do anyway. Right. Yeah. right. So, I mean, we could, there are many potential reasons about why we might see differences here or not. Um, for example, they do not report being any more involved in SOP, um, SOP uh, involvement. Uh, that said, this also includes among the sample individuals who were involved in pre, who we might expect would be very heavily involved in SOP. So to not find differences between there suggests um, there's, they're doing this to some degree, but just not more than other individuals are. We ask questions about research with faculty, theme housing, Greek organizations, student organizations, and uh, likelihood of be, uh, becoming uh, residence hall staff uh, within the residences. Uh, again, equivalent between the groups. Um, a number of reasons we could speculate. I'd be happy to go into them, but I do wanna um, just really quick point out a couple of other findings that I think are interesting specifically as we approach the period in time in which individuals, um, we have our first graduating class of FYP individuals this year. Um, we find that the, the pattern of the results is generally not affected by participant sex or whether they're a first generation college student. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of findings that do emerge there, um, but it's, they're here or there. Um, they're not very, uh, perhaps, spurious relationships and things like that. Um, not any significant pattern really emerging. Oh, excuse um, me, Jordan. Yeah. Didn't you say, um, I'm trying to remember the stat, was it 18 or 20 percent identified as first generation students? Uh, about 15 percent. 15, uh, is that on par across the university? I think that that is about right, although I, I don't have, personally I don't have the, Deb, do you happen to know if no, that's, that's about question, right? But I, I would say as well that when we look at a number of the other demographic features, they're, they're sort of on par across uh, when you look at FYP students versus not, say yeah. racial breakdown, uh, sex, and right. so on. Um, so it's, it, it doesn't seem to be the case that our sample was collected in a way that led us to be um, not confident that it was representative of those groups. Okay, thanks, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, quite were, all right. But were there any differences in any aspect of because I mean, this is a group that's selecting this, right? So right. Yes, and it's a lower percentage. So, so that would be different than if you had a random set of kids yeah, that one went through and one did. You've actually filtered them at the beginning right. and, and, and see whether that filter actually reinforced perhaps pre predisposed behavior. Sure. So the question is, do you have any sense from when you start out, what is the difference between these two groups that choose and not choose? Mm -hmm. Are they better students? Are they more likely to bond with with adults, so we have right. sense of that I mean, we only have the things that we might speculate based on their interest in volunteering. You're right, we, we didn't randomly assign some of them to be an FYP and some of them not to provide a comparison. Although, as an experimentalist, I love that idea. Um, <laughs> you know, let's just go ahead and do it. Um, uh, that said, I, I would say that, um, let's see, we, we also have some information about um, uh, region of the country that they come from and things like that, you know, so we could look into like, are they the individuals coming from farther or yes. not? Uh, we have things like their GPA entering in, but with the way it's reported to admissions, um, I, I'm really skeptical of anything that that might mean just because it could mean such very different things depending on the school that people come from. Um, but uh, no, I mean, that's, that's a, it's, there's no way of us being able to say with certainty that we are fundamentally looking at entirely similar groups or groups that may be in some way dissimilar from one another because they did opt to do this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let me just uh, real quickly, I know we're, we're short on time. We do see some uh, effects that are different when we look um, across the different class years. So the reports of individuals who are early in their experience here uh, versus later. Um, I won't go into great detail on the statistics, but trust me. <laughs> um, <laughs> This, these are uh, four by two ANOVAs for those who are statistically minded. Uh, essentially what we're looking at here, uh, initial comfort and connection with their first, uh, first year advisor based on class year and whether they were in FYP or not. And I'll, I'll present it sort of sequentially. 
Um, when we look at the non-FYP students, um, we see a pattern that uh, would probably not be surprising to us. Individuals early in their time here uh, feel more connection with that advisor. Um, those who are in their first year most likely still have that very same advisor, so not a huge surprise there. Um, we start to tail off as we get into the sophomore and junior year, and perhaps in sophomore year it is still that same advisor. Um, by junior year, most likely not, although that said, they still feel reasonably connected. Uh, seniors um, feel less so, sort of as time has gone on, and for most of these, they will not continue to be their advisor. Uh, so does their connection with that individual. But we see a different pattern when we look at the FYP students. So early on, FYP students feel uh, a greater connection with their advisor than do non-FYP students. We see similar uh, across FYP and not FYP for sophomore and junior years. But then we see an increase or spike and certainly a difference between uh, then, uh, FYP students and non-FYP students in the senior year. I'll point out when we look at um, how much um, they currently feel this connection with that individual, we see the same pattern again. So I'll pr I've, I've got one more set of findings to present and I'll kind of put these together. Um, folks want to come on in, come on in. <laughs> um, let me just present the next set of findings as well. So this is uh, how much they felt connected to Suwannee overall um, in their first semester. Among non-FYP students, and then among FYP students. So what we seem to be seeing is that senior individuals who were a part of FYP um, seem to have a pretty favorable look on a number of features related to uh, being involved at Suwannee. Uh, let me sort of summarize this and then I'll, I'm happy to chat more about the results. Uh, it seems to be the case when we look big picture at all the findings I presented, FYP students are feeling more connected to their advisor, more connected to Suwannee and the community. Um, these effects seem to be in a substantial way driven by the first year experience and then also by senior individuals. Um, and in some ways, senior individuals looking back at their experience. Um, I don't know, I, I was, I don't know, I was fascinated. Uh, I love a good statistical interaction, so they always fascinate me. Um, but I was like, well, what's going on here? Um, and at first I thought like, well, is, it, is there something weird going on about the sample? But that said, when we look at the demographics across all the different groups and acro across all the class years, uh, we don't see anything remarkable there. It wasn't as though we had just 20 seniors complete the survey, and it was the 20 most invested seniors. It was a big group. Um, so it doesn't seem to be that. Um, I was curious if there were some shifts in the nature of the program, and if that led to some different experiences. Um, but that said, if that was the case, we might have thought that shifts that occurred year to ye year, to year would have produced some differences. Um, but we don't see as much happening in the uh, juniors and uh, uh, the sophomores and the juniors. Um, I guess what I'm calling it is a nostalgia effect, um, a rose-colored glasses effect for seniors. Um, I'll be really happy to hear that. Um, let me just wrap this up with, um, with this uh, quotation, one of my favorites uh, by uh, Adam Weinberg. Uh, when we think about the college experience, so uh, as, he, as he puts it, simply put, a great college exploration program in college should focus on exposing students to a wide range of good mentors and role models who offer advice, networks, experience, skill development. A college is a community and education happens as students interact with, learn, and benefit from peers, faculty, staff, local community members, parents, and alumni. If we get the relationships right, everything else will follow. All right, I think I'm like well over time. Uh, but that's it. Thank you all very much for your attention. To the extent that we have time, I'd be happy to talk more. But I, I certainly don't want to steal away from. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you could take questions in the other.